Hey everybody, welcome to the Portico Podcast. This is Mike Casey, the founder of Portico Advisors, LLC. You know, one of the questions I've often pondered since founding this business is, is emerging markets private equity dying? That literally was the name of the first study I published when I launched the company in 2016. And I perhaps naively thought that drawing attention to some of the industry's problems might catalyze people to action. So to put some figures on it, between 2010 and 2015, the number of growth equity funds achieving a close had declined by more than 30%, and fund vehicles greater than or equal to $1 billion in size grew from 40% to 60% of all the capital that was raised. So capital was consolidating in fewer, larger managers, mostly in Asia, while at the same time, the number of first-time funds holding a final close had been declining by 10% each year. And the development finance institutions were exacerbating the trends committing to more funds series four plus than they were to funds one, two, or three. So did things change? Well, suffice it to say that last October, I put out a newsletter that reframed the question to, is EMPE dead? So I wanted to bring on someone who could speak to the state of EM private markets. And that guest is Greg Bowes, co-founder and managing principal of Albright Capital, a global investment firm with expertise in special situations, infrastructure, infrastructure services, and real assets. You know, the label variant perception gets bandied about quite a lot, mostly as nonsense, quite frankly. But Greg genuinely does have a different view on EM private markets than most of the managers I've met, and I thought he'd be a great guide to walk through where the industry is in the summer of 2021. So in today's conversation, Greg and I discuss the question of should investors even be investing in EM private markets? The impact of currency depreciations on the performance of EM funds and whether investors should hedge their currency exposures? The shortcomings of the traditional approach to EM private equity and how that traditional approach magnifies the impacts of adverse cross-currency moves, the problem of herd behavior, the importance of sound deal structuring in EM, and much, much more. I've included some additional readings in the show notes, so dive in if you're keen to learn more. But until then, I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, Greg, welcome to the Portico Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Great to be here. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. So, you know, I'm pretty jazzed up about this conversation because you have a different perspective on EM private markets than many of the managers with whom I speak. And I thought that we could focus our discussion on the big picture question of the state of the emerging market private equity or private markets industry. And so I guess to start, you know, should investors even be looking at private markets in, in emerging markets? Uh, we think so. Um, and we think that um, there are really good businesses in emerging markets. And there are really important businesses where there is a, a real prospect of good risk adjusted commercial returns and playing an important role in economic development. And so there's a double bottom line a possibility in emerging markets that is fairly prominent. And there's also the the diversification benefits of um, finding opportunities that uh, are not going to track with the rest of your portfolio. So we think there are very good businesses in emerging markets that are that are that are good investments. Uh, we've been through a difficult period, and the conclusion should not be that emerging markets, you can't make money in emerging markets, so that they're not worth it. Uh, we think that's uh, very much the wrong conclusion. Yeah, so maybe we could take a step back there and say, pull on this thread that you mentioned around we've been through a difficult period. You know, maybe you could put some color on that. How how has the performance been for uh, the industry over the last? call it, I don't know, you've been around 15 years as an EM focused firm. So may, over the last 10 to 15 years. Well, very broadly, uh, there was a period from, you know, 2000 to 2010, when, you know, after the bursting of the tech bubble, people were looking for growth opportunities for their portfolios and coinciding with the brick mantra Emerging markets did quite well, and emerging market private markets did pretty well. From about 2011 to the present time, that has been less true. The JP Morgan Emerging Market Currency Index peak to trough is down 52%. 
So currency devaluation, especially ex-Asia, has been uh, a major headwind for investors who chose to take currency risk, either intentionally or unintentionally. And so I think that underpinning a lot of disappointment in emerging market, private market performance across the industry has been that, that singular phenomenon of, of currency devaluation. Our, our view is that inflation has been and will generally be somewhat higher in emerging markets than developed markets. So, so you're going to be exposed to intermittent, irregular uh, currency devaluation. And you have to prepare for that eventuality. Now, what's happened has been rather extreme. And so the prevailing approach to EM private markets has left investors exposed to that currency devaluation. And that has had negative consequences. Got it. Yeah. So I guess, you know, a couple questions that emerge from, from that. I mean, the first is, you know, should anyone in this process be hedging their their currency exposures? And if so, you know, is it the, the fund managers that should be more cognizant of that, whether that's through the sourcing of investments or the employment of uh, derivatives that can lock in uh, exchange rates? Or is it at the LP level that they should be implementing any hedges, if any? Well, that's, it's such a good question, Mike. If you start the biggest picture at the LP level where, where your question ends, we hear a lot of investors say, I'm in emerging markets for the diversification benefits. I can withstand the volatility. I want to take the currency exposure. And there are a few very large institutions who truly have the balance sheet strength and, and cultures to be true to that commitment and just take a very long-term view and not worry about interim volatility and results. There are some institutions like that. Most institutions who believe that they can withstand the volatility, I think are kidding themselves. And when the results are poor, as they have been, they run for the hills as indeed they have been. So being honest for an institution has to be honest with themselves about what kind of volatility they're prepared to withstand. And if they're not honest with themselves up front, then that creates a you know, mismatch of expectations. So if you start with the premise that most institutions w- don't really want to see sharply negative interim results, and that's, that's my belief, if that's the reality, then they need to deploy capital in a way that reduces that probability. And I would submit that the way most people have, have approached EM private markets increases that probability. Doesn't reduce it, it increases it. The prevailing approach has been country funds, boots on the ground, emphasis on consumer growth, development of domestic markets, all of which in various ways have magnified the exposure to currency devaluation. And you end up with this debate as to exactly your point, Mike, who's taking the currency decision? Is the currency decision taken by the LP that invests in the country fund? The GP has a legitimate claim to say that they have essentially made a currency decision when they invested in a country fund. And then the LP has a case to make for the GP, you know, gosh, you know, I need to get hard currency returns. It's not helpful to get local currency returns. And yes, these might be good local businesses, but, you know, I need to get, I need to get get returns in hard currency. So there is a some fundamental fault lines in the prevailing approach to EM private markets. Again, that prevailing approach has been the growth mantra, country funds, regional funds, and a, a strong belief in the emergence of a consumer class, which has led to the investment in, in domestically oriented businesses. Another way of putting it, Mike, is that the macro question is the beginning of the process. What country should I invest in? And we would submit that the process should be flipped and it should be a micro question of where is there a really good business? And then let me think about the the macro risks that that business is confronting as a critical but, but second order step in the process. 
So do you begin with the macro, pick the country, pick the country fund, and expose yourself to significant currency risk? Or do you start with the micro and say, I'm looking for businesses that don't have a lot of currency risk. I'm looking for hard currency revenues. I'm looking for export generated revenues. But just to your first question is, do you hedge? We don't think generally hedging is, is cost efficient. We think that the currency management has to be baked into the deal selectivity and the deal structuring. And that's really the only way to mitigate um, the currency risk. You, the, the hedging is, is not really a, a good approach um, given the costs involved. I, I wanna sort of pull on that macro is the beginning of the process question because I mean, I gave a presentation a while ago and tried to look at the evolution of the EMPE industry. And for whatever reason, you know, the herd mentality, LPs tend to eschew specific countries or regions at their nadir, right? When they're completely unattractive, when valuations would be bombed out. And then it's only when, you know, Brazil's on the cover of The Economist and, you know, the Corcovado's streaming up into the stratosphere that investors dogpile into Brazil all at the same time. And we saw the same thing with Africa. And you just see this tsunami of capital come in, everyone piling in at the same time. And that's when valuations go to the stratosphere. It's when the currency is overvalued. So it, it almost seems like every single metric is working against LP's favor when they go into these markets, which ostensibly have, they're, they, they're fully priced in by the time they can, the investment committees are willing to write a check for, for a manager. I don't know, maybe you could just react to that. Well, I, I tend to agree with you, Mike. I think that that is what happens. And <clears throat> when you think about how decisions are made in institutional portfolios, this is understandable. Human nature is what it is. And we could argue that the consultant community isn't necessarily incentivized to present out of consensus ideas. You could argue that investment committees by their nature feel more comfortable with consensus ideas. Um, you could argue that investment staffs are not necessarily incentivized to take out of consensus um, opinions. So I, I also want to pull on another comment that you made, which contrasted this sort of top-down macro view on markets where LPs may want to allocate capital. And that's to sort of say, well, let's say you wanted to employ a micro um, strategy. And if you were to do so, how often is it the case that you encounter situations where there are companies or you know, businesses that are better credits than the countries where they're jurisdiction or, or domiciled? And, and if that's the case, like how, how should investors be thinking about that complexity when it comes to emerging markets? Yeah, th this is an important question. There's an EM navigational skill. Like anything, when you deal with emerging market risks and you learn how to address them, like anything, you get better at it. And, you know, the problem that I described about, you know, the natural tendency towards consensus conclusions, that's true in all markets. But that tendency has dire consequences in emerging markets for the reasons that you articulate. If you start with the premise that you have to be local to get the best deals in emerging markets, that premise is incorrect and it leads you to country funds and it leads you to magnifying your currency exposure. And it leads you, as you suggest, to invest in a country at a time when it's very popular. These countries have limited absorptive capacity. So when the countries are popular, the currency is often highly valued and asset values are usually simultaneously high. And it probably is true that at that moment, when there's competition among investors for the best deals, that being local probably gives you an advantage uh, to get into the quote unquote best deals. 
arguably there aren't that many very good deals at that moment. So being local and getting preferential access is actually not very helpful. The flip side is when a country is out of favor in your scenarios, then there's not competition amongst investors for deals and being local is not as helpful. So the trick is to create an ability to look for good deals and good assets wherever they might be. Now, local perspective is crucial. So don't get me wrong. It's not that you know you can just helicopter in and not have any clue about the local realities. You must have local perspective, of course, but you should not relegate yourself to one jurisdiction when looking for the best deals. And your point about essentially political risk is correct. Political risk, if you have the government as a counterparty in some kind of concession arrangement is dramatically higher than if you're doing business in a particular jurisdiction and you have a multinational corporation as your counterpart. And so this old saw that no company in a particular country can have a higher credit rating than the than the country itself, which the rating agencies have, have always put forward, is also incorrect. There are good companies in emerging markets that generate hard currency revenues, either through export activities or through infrastructure activities um, with valuable real assets and um, that do a great job. But you're not going to get into those investments at a reasonable price when that jurisdiction is popular in the scenarios that you highlight. You have to be willing to be a bit contrarian. Again, investment processes don't always uh, provide for this very easily. And then, of course, you have to decide, which I think you refer, you know, kind of inferred before, you know, when is a country simply out of favor amongst global investors? And when is it a value trap and the next Venezuela? And of course, that also comes back to this EM navigational skill um, that I highlight to make those evaluations. If you were to employ a different approach, would it would it be simply taking the inverse of that country growth um, concentration versus diversification and value? Or, or is, what, what is the way that uh, investors may want to think about other ways of getting access to, to emerging markets? I guess investors, on the one hand, investors could say, boy, the macro, the country funds, the growth mantra, the consumer orientation, you know, how do I respond to a 52% peak to trough decline in the JP Morgan emerging market currency index? On the one hand, you could say, I'm going to go in and take that risk. You know, because if, you know, the dollar, which has been a straight line up for, you know, it's, it's paused a little bit more recently, but you know, for a decade or so, it was straight line up. If that undertow were to reverse and emerging market currencies were going to do better comparatively to, to hard currency um, alternatives, then maybe you want to invest in exactly where you know, the pain has been the greatest. That's one solution. The other solution is to say, I really don't want to take that kind of volatility. I really don't want to take that kind of currency risk. My organization doesn't deal with it well. Um, there is a, a natural changeover in staff who, and, and sometimes the initial premise of an investment is forgotten. And you look at an investment, it's got losses, and you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. So that opens up, I think, the possibility that, that there's another approach to emerging markets, which is a little less macro, certainly not as the driver, a little more micro, a little more deal selectivity, not relegating yourself to one jurisdiction, a little more value orientation. Um, um, Growth is great, but you don't want to pay up for it as an investor. Greater emphasis on deal structuring so that if an investment doesn't seem to have too much currency risk baked into it, you might be able to structure away some of the residual currency risk that you're still left with. You know, special situation investing is a choice in developed markets, arguably. In emerging markets, good deal structuring 
is critical. So it's not, it's just necessary. And if you're investing in a plain vanilla security, whether it's listed or, or private markets, you're more likely to be subject to the volatility of the asset class than if you've been able to create a customized security in a negotiation that um, you know, has some ability to protect against prevailing macro um, phenomenon or you know, especially, especially on the currency side. Yeah, interesting. You know, as I reflect on the question, I would have to say that you know, investors have, as a general rule, according to MPIA's sort of industry statistics and that they put out, They've they've kind of walked away from your traditional PE funds, and they've they've embraced private credit strategies to a degree, and um, have really engorged on on venture capital. I don't know if the, if you have a reaction to that. Are those two strategies? I mean, they're different uh, in many ways, but you know, is are there any thoughts that you have about the the soundness of those strategies and and when they're they're applicable and when when they're not? Well, as, as listeners of this podcast may gather, we, we, we tend to be um, infrastructure and real asset investors. And so we're not experts on technology approaches. It does strike me that there's some, some interesting opportunities in emerging markets where the economy jumps over you know, for instance, in telecoms, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody's going to, you know, build a lot of, you know, telephone wires around emerging markets. You know, it's, it's, you know, you can kind of skip that whole stage of economic development and go and go straight to wireless. And we like telecom infrastructure as an asset class, in part because your counterparty risk is not the government, as we discussed already. And it's really interesting um, in that area, you know, the, the gap in valuation between um, emerging markets and developed markets is, is really quite extreme, you know, comparing apples to apples. If you take a, a listed company and a full disclosure, we, we are a shareholder, as is well known, um, Helios Towers in Africa, you know, that's trading... EV to 2022 EBITDA, somewhere between nine and 10 times. And the developed market average is 21 times. You know, you've got half the multiple and, and a substantially better growth profile in that cell phone penetration is approximately 40% in Africa. And independent tower co's own you know, something in the order of 29% of all towers versus a global average of 70%. And cell phone penetration in developed markets is 100%. So the preference for developed market exposure, and again, this is an apples to apples comparison. A lot of times when people compare valuations in EM and DM, they're, they're comparing very different risk profiles. They're comparing infrastructure assets with venture capital in China. You know, these are, you've got to, <laughs> you, you've got you've got to create an apples to apples comparison, and so in this particular area where where we have spent a lot of time, you have arguably half the valuation metric and twice the growth opportunity. Yeah. So so if I'm an investor and and my ears perk up at this, you know, you know, the immediate question is, well, why? Why is why does this discount exist? Investors have had bad experience in emerging markets, ex-Asia. Outside of China, results have been either poor or mixed at best. So when investors have problems in their portfolio in Africa or in Latin America, and they've had a tough time, it's hard to get an investment committee to say, oh, now's the time to do, you know, to look at Africa. So these markets are just way out of favor. I don't think it's a lot more complicated than that. And a lot of investors never approved Africa as an investment destination to begin with. And a lot of investors and other investors have dipped their toe in the water and, and gotten burned. Again, that's either because A, you can't make money in these markets and there aren't any good businesses, or B, maybe they did it the wrong way and they could have been a little more thoughtful about deployment rather than simply buying into a country narrative and a country fund and a growth narrative, and then kind of let the micro and the deal selection 
be a second order set of decisions. I, I hadn't thought of this question until you mentioned it, but like, you know, as I think back, I think about this search for yield, right, over, over multiple cycles, where when there were large bouts of liquidity in the financial system, investors would be prompted on this search for yield and money would find its way to emerging markets. And we've just seen a bazooka, you know, squared uh, in terms of uh, liquidity provisions and uh, in the face of this pandemic. And yet, you know, emerging markets have not, to my mind at least, benefited as I think they would have 10 years ago, right? Maybe I'm completely wrong here and completely off, but has there been a change in where investors go when they're on this search for yield? Um, have, have emerging markets lost their place in, in that framework? Or, or am I just like totally off base here with the question? Well, I think it's interesting. And I think it's a, a moment to make an observation, which is that the liquidity provision that you refer to globally has made it into emerging markets. It's made it into EM listed markets. It's made it into the more liquid sectors to some extent. Now, I mentioned Helios, that's a public company and we think it's fundamentally cheap. Again, full disclosure, we're a shareholder. So it hasn't made it into all areas of listed markets, but some of that global liquidity has made it into emerging markets. So you have seen yield compression in the EM high yield area, for instance. But the drop off in liquidity between EM listed markets, especially the big you know, state owned enterprises and whatnot, and private markets, especially middle market private markets is extreme. So let's put it another way. Liquidity preference within the emerging markets asset class is as high as we have ever seen it. People will invest in emerging markets. They do have emerging market investments but they want liquidity. They want to be able to get out when they make that decision. Now, that, that's an interesting thing to examine. On what basis will they get out? When do they want to get out? Is emerging markets a market timing asset class? Is it leveraged beta, essentially? We went back and did an analysis and said that if a long-only investor invested in listed in the MSCIEM and had the ability to pick the absolute low points and sell at the absolute high points and be uninvested when, when the index went down, which of course no investor can do, how would they have done? And the results were surprising. They did not do as well as one might think. Investors kind of look at EM and they go, wow, every once in a while, this, you know, the MSCI end up is up 30%. I want that. I just don't want it the rest of the time. And there's this illusion of being able to market time. And there's also this illusion that some of these stocks are, you know, are liquid enough to be able to get in and out. But the big drop off in, in investor interest between EM public markets and private markets, that's really extreme right now. And so that's that's the main thing I would just um, share, at least at least from from our perspective. Sticking with this this issue of dislocations, and you know, you mentioned the one between the public markets and the private markets. You know, let's, I want to just sort of wrap my arms around the impact that COVID had, and you know, the COVID pandemic created a variety of dislocations across EM, including capital scarcity, which, as you rightly point out, in EM private markets, particularly for mid-market businesses, is very acute. You know, I don't know if you want to make a comment on that, but I think more importantly, or more interestingly, what are the long-term changes that you think are going to um, emerge as a result of this across EM uh, for, for private markets investors? Well, I guess just, just a couple of observations come to mind. First of all, we believe that the credit dislocation in emerging markets was already in place before COVID. So you had this extended period of currency devaluation. You had an extended period of, of debt buildup. You, you've seen the emerging market corporate hard currency debt market grow like crazy over the last 10 or so years and now exceed, significantly exceed the US high yield market in size. So you've had leverage go 
you've had currencies go down, you've had all the ingredients of, you know, of stress. And of course, COVID then comes on top of that. It's a very different circumstance in developed markets where COVID came on top of arguably relatively healthy credit markets. So when COVID dissipates as a phenomenon, and then we were always going to win the battle against COVID. It was just a question of time, but you're going to have strained sovereign finances for some time to come. And that will have an impact in a variety of ways, you know, on currencies, on credit availability. And it does make it somewhat urgent that we find conduits for private capital to make it into emerging markets to support good businesses that are worthy of support that um, you know are suffering from macro events outside of their control, I- including COVID. So um, this is urgent. It's very important. And so we have this you know unfortunate simultaneous need for capital you know amongst good middle market companies suffering from macro events outside of their control, with investors having had a poor recent experience, for whatever reason, and private capital being wary of of the very markets where their capital is needed and and arguably might be valued more greatly than in developed markets. So are we at the nadir in in sentiment for EM markets, EM private markets? Uh, Who knows, right? Um, (laughs) You know, it felt like the nadir in sentiment for EM private markets, uh, you know, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. Exactly. But we're pretty confident that what will happen is what normally happens is that people who invest at the right time in the cycle and who see the value and who go where their capital is going to be the most valued are going to end up making some pretty good returns. And then sentiment will change. We think the timing is pretty good for EM markets, but we're under no illusions that a lot of committees will will, uh, pile in. All right. So two more two more questions. So let's say um, an allocator is listening to this podcast and they have the realization, you know what, Greg was right. EM's been trash. It's been a headache. I'm tired of the brain damage. But he's also right in that, you know, we were thinking about it one way, you know, the country dedicated growth consumer story. But, you know, we didn't think about it this different way. And maybe he's right that these markets are facing some dislocations, particularly the mid-market companies are facing some dislocations. And some creative financiers might be able to help these companies grow, capture market share, et cetera, et cetera. What one piece of advice would you give uh, to that allocator? Pick a good partner who understands how to navigate these markets. Okay, the last question I have for you is, now, what are you most excited about looking ahead? You know, it's been it's been a slog going through all the the last decade of EM private markets, uh, and particularly the last two to three years have been challenging. But you know, is there light on the horizon? If so, like, what are you really excited about? Well, um, I've always gravitated towards inefficient markets and value oriented situations. Value is out of favor in developed markets, and value is way out of favor in emerging markets. So um, I think there's it's exciting to be able to find you know good businesses and good management teams that are executing that um, that that you can support. You know, at this point in the cycle, fundraising is more difficult, but finding good deals is easier. Bottom line, we'd rather have that. I like it. All right. Well. Greg, this has been fun and edifying. Uh, so thanks for thanks for coming on. And uh, you know, if you know, if anyone else wants to learn anything else, where where would you point them to go? Well, Mike, I think you're one of the most thoughtful people on the asset class around. And so thanks for having me. And um, and I think if they keep reading your thoughtful remarks and listening to your podcasts, I think they they should find it helpful. Well, thank you for that, Greg. Appreciate the plug. Um, okay, have a great day. And, and again, thanks for including me. Hey, everyone, this is Mike again. Thank you for listening. 
I hope you found the conversation edifying. And if you have any feedback, good or bad, please send me an email at mike at porticoadvisors.com. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend, colleague, or your connections on social media. Or if you feel like it, leave us a review on your podcast player of choice. If you're keen to learn more about private markets developments across the emerging markets, then go ahead and smash the subscribe button and please visit our website, porticoadvisors.com. That's P-O-R-T-I-C-O-A-D-V-I-S-E-R-S.com where you can peruse through our research and newsletter archives and sign up for our monthly-ish newsletter. Ciao for now. The discussion in this podcast is for informational purposes only. Neither Portico Advisors LLC nor its guests plan to update this material, and the opinions and conclusions mentioned may change without notice. Neither Portico Advisors LLC nor its guests make any warranty that the information in this podcast is error-free, omission-free, complete, accurate, or reliable. Nothing contained in this podcast should be construed as legal, tax, securities, or investment advice.